I've been talking about the quest to understand the size and shape of the Earth that took place in ancient times. I'm not the first person to look at this work and be led to the case much later in time of Columbus and to ask, what did he know of this work? And how did it influence his ideas about voyaging to the Indies? Frankly, there are entire books on the subject, but let's talk about a few issues. First, it hardly needs to be said that Columbus was not seeking to prove that the Earth was round. Columbus's proposal for his voyage was rejected by the Portuguese and Milanese crowns, not because they believed the Earth was flat. In fact, almost all educated people in the West since the 5th century BCE were aware that the Earth is spherical. Although, to be fair, what is known by the educated is not always known by everyone, case in point being the established biological fact of evolution and the fact that some 50% or more of Americans don't believe in evolution. But that's another story. The idea that Columbus was rejected because of beliefs in a flat Earth seems to have originated with the early 19th century American writer Washington Irving, who made that up and put it into his biography of Columbus from 1828. No, he was rejected because Portuguese savants had an accurate idea of the size of the earth and knew that no ship of the 15th century could possibly have provisioned itself for a journey of at least 12,000 miles from the Canary Islands to Japan. They knew that the trip was not viable and that their money would be wasted. It's only because neither Columbus nor the European monarchs were aware of the existence of North and South America that Columbus was ever heard of again. But what led Columbus to believe otherwise? To believe his voyage was viable, in contrast to the educated beliefs of his day. Columbus was a sailor, but not a scholar, and his study of the matter was not that of a careful scientific mind. There are several possible sources of error. I talked recently about the early mathematical geographers. Check out that video for a more thorough discussion of early attempts at measuring the size of the Earth. Eratosthenes made reasonably accurate measurements of the size of the Earth in the 3rd century BCE at 252,000 Greek stades, which comes very close to the actual measurement of 24,860 miles. But there's always been some controversy about the measurements of Posidonius, who did confirmatory measurements in the 1st century BCE. Ptolemy, the most influential geographer of the ancient world, came up with a measurement for the circumference of the Earth of 180,000 stades, the same as that of Posidonius. It's not clear whether Ptolemy was led astray by Posidonius's errors or by errors in interpreting the actual size of the Greek stade that Eratosthenes was using. But it is clear that Ptolemy believed that the Earth's circumference was about 30% smaller than its actual size. And his work was among the best preserved of ancient science for the next more than thousand years. Little of the actual texts of Eratosthenes or Posidonius survived, but those of Ptolemy thrived. In addition, Ptolemy made another crucial error. He estimated longitudinal distance based on the timing of a lunar eclipse at two different points that occurred during the war between Alexander and the Persian Empire. By the time Ptolemy studied the matter, these reports were several hundred years old. The eclipse began at 8 p.m. in Gogamela in Persia and at 5 p.m. in Carthage, far to the west. Three hours difference, or one-eighth of the 24-hour day, indicates that these two places are separated on the Earth's surface by 45 degrees. But in actuality, they're only separated by 33 degrees. Therefore, Ptolemy had an exaggerated notion of the size of the Mediterranean and the Near East, which led him to misinterpret the extent of the Eurasian landmass. Instead of the actual figure of about 130 degrees of latitude from the Atlantic coast to the eastern coast of China, or about a third of the Earth's circumference, Ptolemy believed it to extend to about 180 degrees of latitude. In other words, that the Eurasian landmass was about half the circumference of the entire Earth. Further, the ancient geographer Marinus of Tyre extended it further and believed in a Eurasian landmass figure of about 225 degrees of latitude, and Columbus seems to have favored Marinus's figure. 
These errors had long been corrected by the time of Columbus. I discussed the work of the 11th century mathematician and geographer Al Biruni in a previous video, and he also recalculated latitude, coming up with a reasonably accurate estimate of the extent of the Eurasian landmass. He even suggested that additional continents might be found one day in the vastness of the Earth's oceans. Columbus was also misled by the reports of Marco Polo of the islands of Japan, which he called Japangu. Marco Polo had an exaggerated view of the size and the position of Japan, extending the Asian lands even further to the east and closer to Europe. Two 15th century maps illustrate overly optimistic and geographically incorrect ideas that may have influenced Columbus's errors. Here is the 1474 map by Paolo del Pozzo Toscanelli, with which Columbus was familiar, with the actual geography superimposed. You see that on this map, the eastern edge of what was called by Marco Polo Chipangu, or Japan, is located somewhere in the middle of the actual country of Mexico. It's not so unrealistic to believe that one could sail from the Canary Islands to that point on the very small Atlantic Ocean. And here is a map by Martin Beheim, creator of the world's oldest surviving globe. In Beheim's view, Japan is located only 1,500 miles west of the Canary Islands, making it a tempting and realistic target for Columbus's voyage. Of course, neither of these maps reflect the informed geographical knowledge of the day. They were not accepted as accurate by the savants of the Portuguese royal court, or even by Ferdinand and Isabella, who took a chance on Columbus despite the cautions of their scientific advisors. Which leads to an interesting question. These facts were put before Columbus when he argued his case. Why was he not persuaded by the evidence? Perhaps he possessed a rock-solid conviction of his point of view. He was right, and others were misguided. Perhaps he trusted his sources, trusted his biases, and probably not coincidentally, these gave him the answer that he desired. There is another possibility. Perhaps Columbus understood these facts, but wanted to try anyway. Could his arguments to his patrons have been knowingly false, designed to get their support? Maybe Columbus was just determined and thought he would find islands along the way to reprovision himself with. Or maybe he thought he was a man of destiny who would overcome all odds and prevail despite the evidence against him. We will probably never know. But what we do know is that the ancient astronomers and mathematicians left considerable evidence about the size and shape of the Earth. But human motivation and human bias are powerful forces, and often people use information and scholarship in support of their biases. In the case of Columbus, he was lucky. He wasn't forced to pay a price for his biases by the sheer fortune that the New World existed, and he ran into the Caribbean islands east of the mainland. Others would have followed if Columbus had become convinced of his errors and canceled his voyages. It was actually the British explorer John Cabot who discovered the North American coast five short years later in 1497. But Columbus's determination to stick to his errors made him one of the most influential, if misinformed, people of his day. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow my Instagram. And thanks a lot for watching.